probably make it down to the city. Hey, Sean. Thanks for joining us. Where are you today? Uh, oh, no, you're on mute. I'm, I'm in Cape Town in my office. Um, mm -hmm. Greetings, everyone. You're back home after a lot of travel, huh? Yeah. Scott is here. Kenny. Jeff. So, yeah, I guess uh, we have a lot to cover, and all of the panelists are here, so I think I'm kind of keen to jump in because I think we could take probably two hours or more to talk about all these things. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and say welcome everyone and thanks for joining and we may have some other people booping in here in the next few minutes um, but I guess in the meantime we can do a quick round of intros um, with our lovely guests and friends today. Um, I guess Griff if you want to go first I think everybody knows you by now but you could do a quick one and then pass it. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Griff Green. I've been obsessed with bonding curves ever since I, I heard about them and, and really especially since Jeff's article back in like 2018 uh, and can't can't stop it. I can't stop myself. I just want more bonding curves. I got it. I got it. The only prescription is more bonding curves. So I'm so excited to be here with the people who are really using bonding curves to push it forward like Sean and Ixo and of course Jeff and I uh, with pushing our the commons dream and, uh, and the inventor of, of bonding curves himself Simon de la Rouvier who uh, uh, also needs definitely needs no introduction but I'll let you try. Thank you. Um, yeah uh, Simon uh, I've been involved in crypto space for a few years which included a lot of um, time doing research and writing and just publishing thoughts in a, for, a very, uh, for a decent amount of period. And that's where I also uh, came up with the bonding curves. But as is usually the case, you know, back in those days, I used to share these ideas with 30 to 40 people. So, you know, no man is an island. Um, and these days I am enjoying doing more storytelling and writing um, and still working in the creative industries um, using NFTs as a business model for writers and authors. Um, yeah, that's where I'm spending most of my time these days. Um, I can pass it on to Jeff. That's great. Uh, Jeff here. I've uh, been working at the Common Stack and Block Science. And uh, yeah, I, a lot of my early inspiration came from Simon's articles. Um, I, I delved down the rabbit hole um, of uh, the Rube Goldberg machines and uh, <laughs> that uh, Simon was theorizing about combining um, you know, bonding curves and different primitives uh, into curation markets, uh, which kind of came together with a lot of other ideas uh, going on at the time to uh, combine these economic and uh, uh, governance primitives into larger uh, cyber physical commons ecosystems, how we can kind of build um, digital or cyber physical community centers that can uh, aggregate collective preference and allow people to uh, pool capital to get things done uh, in small purpose-driven communities. Um, so really excited to be here and discuss these primitives today. Uh, but before we get into it, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Sean Conway. Hi guys, it's really a, a, amazing to be here with you. And um, yeah, thinking back, it's been quite a, a journey. I, I, I think Simon, I'm, I'm here in the, in the office where I first met you, what is it, <laughs> five, six years ago. Um, and- uh, Yeah, 2014 really I think. Been was it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. gosh, I feel like an old man. Um, <laughs> and uh, bonding curves have obviously been a really important part of what what Ixo is about. Um, really, though, with the focus on on how do we link uh, what uh, goes on chain, the states of the chain, with what goes on in the real world. So, earth state, chain state. How do we create that connection? Um, bonding curves create a, an economic interface that is super important. Um, and we've done quite a bit of experimentation and research with block science and it's uh, so really building on the shoulders of, um, of other giants. And uh, um, I guess it would be quite interesting to think like where we are on, uh, on the curve. Uh, if we had a bonding curve that was sort of a meta bonding curve for all of this stuff, it would be beyond that curve. 
Great. Well, thanks for that. And I guess I'll introduce myself. So I'm Jessica Zartler, and I've been um, with the Common Stack for a year and a half. And now with Block Science as a token engineering researcher and communicator in the space. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, you touched on Sean kind of interfaces. We'll get into that in a bit. I just wanted to double check before we continue that we are recording. Can a or uh, Yin, can you give me the thumbs up? Okay, awesome. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so yeah, I guess the first thing is uh, definition here a bit. What is a bonding curve? And I guess I'll pass it to Simon for that as you were, you know, kind of deriving this original vision and idea for what this is. So yeah, I mean, I mean, these days, like people have started using the name for other defin definitions of like stuff that's like price curves, linear price curves, stuff that just increases in value as there's more of. But the primary sort of definition I like to use is, is that it's just, um, it defines as a, um, uh, a, a relationship between um, the price of a token um, and the amount of that's in circulation or in, in supply. Um, and ideally there should be a, a reserve attached to it such that people can sell back. So it's just, it, it, it's just, uh, my definition is really just that it's, it's, uh, that relationship between token price and supply and ability to buy and sell new tokens coming into circulation. Um, I could I could probably also just give some context about you know where why I was thinking about this stuff back in the day, and the name actually comes or is derived from um, a term I, I called which is a bonded curation community, and so it was essentially people using a token to curate information. Um, and there had to be some decentralized way to mint these tokens. It, 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 and I was curious to figure out what that would look like instead of some company or institution or group of people issuing tokens and then distributing it to other people, there would merely be a protocol, which if people agreed that this was fair, they could only interact with the protocol to get the tokens to buy and sell them rather than there being some other kind of authority that issues these tokens. Um, so yeah, bonding curves come from the fact that it's supposed to bond a community together. And how is it different than an AMM? I think there's kind of still like, you know, there's not really an authority or a, a standard commission <clears throat> on these definitions. So what is, um, how is it different than yeah. like a liquidity pool or? Yeah, so I, an, an automated market maker like Uniswap and all the curve and balancer and, and all the different variations, they tend to define a relationship between two existing assets. So it would be like the Ether already exists and um, USDC already exists and, and they define a price relationship between these two assets. But bonding curves is supposed to play with the issuance of new assets. So it's, it's, it's like the, this asset doesn't exist yet. It would be created through the bonding curve itself. Um, so I, that's the basic their version, I would say, is the difference between the two. It 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 can act and look very similar, right? Because if if an asset already exists, it functions the same for from a you know price appreciation or like the choice that a user needs to make. Um, but the fact that there's an indefinite supply is part of the features of a a bonding curve because uh, the 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 economy can expand based on various rules and protocols. Mm. I've actually been doing a bit of drawing uh, on the <laughs> on the um, bonding curves as as they've been talked about um, in in the common stack community and uh, and a lot of Simon's writing um, are a primary market bonding curves versus secondary market uh, AMM. So I did I did a bit of a sketch here. Uh, maybe I'll just pull it up uh, if everyone can see that. I uh, got a new tablet, so I've been practicing my uh, sketching on that. So on the left hand side, we have a um, uh, SAMM, a secondary AMM, where it's um, you have sort of two different roles. You have the liquidity provider and you have a trader. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have like the ETH DAI liquidity pool, for example. Now, the important thing about AMMs like Uniswap, and this is why it's a secondary market, because neither ETH nor DAI are actually created by the bonding curve. They're just entered into liquidity pools so that traders can trade between them. The token that's actually created by the bonding curve in a traditional AMM is the LP token. So when you put ETH and DAI into a pool, you get ETH DAI LP tokens out. Um, and then you might go and stake those and get 
liquidity mining rewards or yield, uh, yield farming rewards. Um, and if you contrast this to a PAMM, so a primary market uh, AMM, like the augmented bonding curve, uh, you put in the reserve asset like DAI or XDAI or wrapped XDAI, depending on the um, chain you're on. Uh, and then you get the token minted from that bonding curve uh, in return. So this is a primary market bonding curve. It creates and destroys supply of the native token when you enter reserve, as opposed to a secondary market AMM like Uniswap or SushiSwap, where someone comes along as a liquidity provider and enters both assets, which were already in existence. So this is just a secondary market providing liquidity and they get an LP token, which is basically they can burn back to the bonding curve to reclaim their assets. Uh, so I think this is one of the big differences between bonding curves, how we usually talk about them in the common stack, um, as compared with AMMs like Uniswap or SushiSwap, where you enter two assets that are already in existence uh, into a liquidity pool, uh, and it provides liquidity for tokens that are already in existence, as opposed to creating a new token uh, through minting and burning. Yeah, and that kind of touches on... Um... You know, I guess, Jeff, you talk a lot about this kind of like, uh, if you can see my screen, the normal representation that Simon was talking about is kind of between price and supply, but that there's kind of an element lacking here with the reserve or like just the aspect of, um, I think this kind of give, like it seems to give the illusion of like infinite growth, but you want to touch on that for a minute, anyone? Like, uh does it really, it has this kind of illusion that it's infinite growth, but it's actually a bootstrapping mechanism. Yeah, there, there's definitely, you know, every time you look at a price graph, you expect it to be over time. And so then you see this number go up, right? And it's, but the, the, the challenge with bonding curves, are we're, we're not describing the, the price as it moves over time. We're describing the price as it moves relative to either the supply or, or the collateral that's in the curve. So it's really easy to be like, oh, look, number go up. Yeah, this is going to be great. But really, the price might move. It will have a normal price graph over time, and, and the price will move with market demand. The, the, the real innovation with bonding curves is it allows accurate price discovery for low liquidity markets. Uh, and that's that's like the real magic here, because if you have a small market cap token and, not, and a couple of people want to sell it, no one wants to buy it, the price goes to zero. But if you want to bootstrap an economy, you really want accurate price discovery while you're still small uh, so that it can grow. And I would say even once you get to a certain point, you'd even you, most e economies, if they grow to a certain point, would probably want to turn off their bonding curve like DXDAO did because you don't need, once you have a large enough market, you don't need the liquidity that a bonding curve, a traditional, like, bon uh, like the augmented bonding curve would provide. So you, you, once you get enough liquidity in the market, then you even want to turn off the bonding curve. And DXDAO even pulled the collateral out of their curve and uh, used that for their community. So there, there's a lot of uh, unique innovation that can still come. <coughs> yeah, I just want to take a moment also. Um, we have some, you know, kind of questions pre-populated. But if anyone here on the AMM, if you want to go into the community hall channel, if you have any questions, and we'll be kind of watching those over the next few minutes. And while you think of your questions and what you're interested to, to hear from our panelists, maybe, Sean, if you can talk a little bit about kind of high level, what are the benefits? I mean, this is just an economic primitive. It's configurable. You can do a lot of different things with it. What are Why should people care about bonding curves? It's, it's an economic primitive. Yeah, so so it, it, it solves, if you look at it in the context of real world um, use cases, and, and I guess the thing that kind of sparked the connection was the word bond, even if it may be, you know, slightly kind of open to interpretation what a bond is um, compared to the way bonds are defined in the uh, financial instruments. Um, but there is there is also an, a, another sort of an anomalous term, which is uh, which is an impact bond or a green bond, which is actually not a bond. It's just, it's just a results based contract. And so it created an interesting connection between the two. But the kinds of challenges that you have um, with trying to implement something like an impact bond. So, and it's just, just to explain very quickly, an impact bond gets um, investors to put uh, money into a, a, an instrument that then gets utilized to implement a project. And then there's some kind of outcome payment if the project succeeds in its, um, in its, in its whatever it's meant to be delivering. Um, so it's results-based financing. And one of the big challenges with that um, is actually forming the capital up front. 
So, you know, if you want to create a bond, you need to get a bunch of investors together um, or an, an impact bond, uh, get the investors together. They all need to agree that they want to put money in at a certain risk um, point and at a certain price on that risk. So you have a, 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 a usually quite prolonged, protracted and difficult process of um, forming the capital because you need to get like-minded and sort of like risk um, appetite investors all together to say, yep, okay, we're going to fund this project for $100,000 and we're all willing to put in a share of that and we all agree on what the coupon value is going to be, which is the return to the investors if the, if the underlying needs. Um, so there you have the first problem is bootstrapping and getting investors in. Um, and most of the implementations, I would say almost every single instance is like a startup. You know, so you can be implementing the same type of bond. You know, it can be uh, we've done 100 of these already education bonds for whatever. But actually, every single real, real world context is a, a new context, is a new set of um, dynamics. And so therefore, it's like a startup. And as we know, some startups fail um, and it takes time to see whether the startup's actually delivering and gaining traction and so on. And so the hesitancy to come in at an early stage, if you're not a really high risk appetite, early stage investor, means that it, it immediately kind of creates an impediment to get going. Um, so with a bonding curve, you can really bring like the high, uh, high risk appetite investors in earlier. You can also distribute some of the share amongst the project implementers and other stakeholders. You know, so you get a way of, of bootstrapping the project. And then over time, as the risk um, declines, as indicated, firstly, by um, the, 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 the kind of cap, capital commitment, the staking into the bond, um, or the buying into the bond, you know, that implies that there is a, a reducing risk over time. And that's why the curve kind of go, goes up in the way that it does. The other thing is pricing um, that risk. So um, if we implement this uh, for the use cases that are uh, results-based financing linked, then you need to have some agreement on what's the, the risk, which is usually expressed as a, an interest rate, you know, a coupon value. Um, and generally, that's overpriced because the risk is unknown. So you'll have you know, base cost of capital, you know, the capital costs you get on the market, bor uh, uh, borrowing capital. Um, but then there's uh, there's a premium on on that, and that factors in profits and risks. Um, and so what we've tried to do to overcome this is to have a dynamic way of repricing as the bond progresses over time um, by bringing signals in from the real world that adjust the bonding curve parameters. Um, and uh, and then the the um, the other. The other sort of necessary um, set of uh, kind of configurations for applying this in the real world is that you, you need to be able to make state changes over time. So um, the original sort of plain vanilla bonding, bonding curves do continue until somebody just says, "Okay, stop." You know, as 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 was mentioned earlier, um, but they don't really have a notion of of state um, in relation to any external um, uh, kind of conditions of state, and so. If you're wanting to do results-based finance, you need to say, all right, the bond is now going to move from being in an open state to being closed and then there's settlement. So, so you kind of have a point in time at which that, 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 um, that bond transitions from one state to another. Um, now, the initial work that was done on this was, was with augmented bonding curves having a hatch phase, which is first state, specific pricing arrangements and supply arrangements around that, and then you set it off into an open phase. Um, with an uh, um, ABC, augmented bonding curve, it just continues. Um, with, a, with an alpha bond, um, which is our variation on that, there is a state change, which is then, uh, then leads to the bond stopping and the distribution event that happens after that. So you bring up the augmented bonding curve, and I think this is a term that, you know, the common stock and also the token engineering commons, you hear a lot. Um, so I guess this is a good time to kind of chat about how can bonding curves be used for a cooperatives or a commons or kind of collective ownership? You mentioned, Sean, fractional ownership. So I don't know, Griff or Jeff, if you both want to touch on this for a minute. Um, how is the bonding curve augmented and um, why does this matter for collective ownership or how? Well, I'll say the big, the big why is that we can actually create public goods focused markets instead of relying on governments and, and taxes and nonprofits to provide value for society at 
their own expense, basically, we can actually create uh, an. Uh, so sorry. So public goods and common pool resources generally are considered non-excludable. As in, if you, anyone can drive on the roads, uh, when you help the homeless, everybody wins. Uh, the the town, the city gains uh, on its own. And so contributions to that uh, and and systems that we try to create are around continuing creating value in that space for societal goods are generally uh, difficult because they don't they can't have a business model there's no customers there's a tragedy of the commons they say but with an, with a with a um, with an economy uh, we can actually create value we can measure the value created through the market means right and so a tech startup for instance can just sell shares and say and and sell partial ownership to investors and start uh, and and basically use their own economic model with their with their startup to uh, where they're creating this this uh, token of sorts like shares in their company to uh, uh, initialize to get seed funding and actually start creating value. Uh, but with a with an augmented bonding curve, we can actually model that same pattern. Uh, that tech startups can use to receive funding and use the bonding curve as a way to coordinate value production around public goods. So without a business model attached. So imagine if uh, if you know you could buy shares in uh, a, a organization that's trying to save the rainforest, uh, and you could actually have upside in their success. This is the kind of tooling that the bonding curves and especially the augmented bonding curve is designed to support. Uh, Jeff, did you want to jive off that? Yeah, definitely. So I, I have a couple of visuals just to go along with uh, what, what you were saying, Griff. So what the what the augmented bonding curve does to augment bonding curves is it introduces this common pool. Uh, and this comes from Ostrom's like, common pool resources. It's essentially the uh, common pool is at the center of the community and everyone can apply to that common pool via proposals or bounties for work that they see needing to get done. So this really turns it from a a top-down to a bottom-up system where anybody who sees an improvement, whether that is, you know, your local neighborhood DAO or perhaps your global healthcare DAO, um, can apply to this common pool, receive funding, and and get work done. So it really turns the um, the tables upside down on uh, on funding. Um, so actually, I'd, I'd love to throw this out to to the community here. I've been doing some thinking about terminology as well, and. There are all sorts of different ways we can augment bonding curves, um, but this particular one um, I think is is interesting because it's a it's a commons market maker. It's a way to not just facilitate the economic flows in a commons, but also to it's it's less important the price of the token as we see in in bonding curves. A lot of these tokens can still be volatile, but the price is not or the the price isn't the important part. The important part is that this common pool is being filled up continuously. Uh, and there are some interesting mechanisms in the augmented bonding curve that make sure that this common pool is continually being filled so that the community can continue to, to fund itself. Um, so the idea behind, uh, as Griff mentioned, uh, an augmented bonding curve or a commons market maker is you have incoming capital. Um, so this is uh, through the hatch or through purchases is split between the reserve and the common pool. We have a bit of older terminology here, which of course funds proposals. And every time someone exits, they pay some tax that goes from the reserve or from their uh, capital that they are exiting into the common pool. So essentially, you can fund the common pool. You put money into the reserve pool, uh, and it mints uh, tokens, for example, and you're moving up the supply curve uh, when you add reserve. Uh, or you can redeem your tokens and reclaim some portion of the of the reserve pool. But every time you do, you are going to pay an exit tax to refill the common pool. Uh, so this is essentially a, a continuous mechanism that ensures that we are aligning the incentives of the people in this in this community. We want to disincentivize exit, uh, and of course, we you know we understand everyone needs to pay their rent or or pay for groceries. Uh, but we want to make sure that there's a, essentially a tithe going to the common pool of the uh, of the of the commons, so that there's funding uh, to continue to get work done. Um, so interesting that there's a, um, an exit tax as opposed to an entry tax. Um, of course, you can configure both. Uh, the ABC is a is a very um, customizable primitive. Uh, but the main reason we put an exit tax is that it kind of puts a systemically it introduces a a, a spark. 
into the system, you know, a bit of new fuel every time someone exits the community. Uh, so there's a, a loopy diagram here that shows uh, sort of the interesting flows. You can see that, yes, the price of the token is volatile. This is not a one-to-one -one demonstration, of course, uh, but it also shows that the funding pool is continually receiving uh, funds from exits in the community. Um, so essentially, there's, there's some interesting um, sort of uh, balancing of incentives here. And we're seeing a lot of this with um, with the Olympus DAO. Um, Ohm, I'm sure a lot of people are looking into uh, Ohm and the, the economics behind that. And it's essentially like mechanisms to counter the run on the bank um, scenario. So the augmented bonding curve or a commons market maker also has a similar uh, hedge against that because as you can see here, as the, as the price increases on the bonding curve, there will be people who want to sell the token, but the more people that sell, uh, there will be a, a counteracting buy pressure because the fewer people hold this token, the fewer people govern the common pool. So every time you have people selling, you'll have uh, um, a countering buy pressure and you really counter this run on the bank, which is kind of one of the, the big concerns of a bonding curve is how do you prevent uh, a rug pull or, or people taking all of the reserve out of the bonding curve and leaving the token uh, essentially valueless. Um, so interesting kind of the, the different mechanisms we can um, uh, build into these systems to ensure that they're, they're um, less volatile and, and longer term price stable. So, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's mitigating the volatility. And then also, I guess that the most interesting aspect is that somebody coming and speculating off of this market, it provides this kind of boundary um, to maintain the value inside. So if people are coming and arbitraging or, or speculating that some of that money, um, it stays within the economy rather than being extracted. Um, so yeah, that's, and also I think, you know, one metaphor uh, to, to help explain is the kind of token physics aspect. I don't know, Simon, if you want to touch a little bit on, on that, I thought it was kind of when I was learning about this, a really helpful metaphor to understand like an invariant and, and how you're, kind of customizing or, or building these functions to provide certain, as Jeff is kind of mentioning, like frictions or. Yeah, um, uh, I'm not, I think someone like Michael Zargon might be able to add, add a good, good commentary here on uh, using terminology like token physics uh, to describe some of these systems. But um, I, I can just add maybe some thoughts around the, different um relationships between like when and where you add friction um i think one thing that's been interesting also what lead led me initially to some of this research was that i was i was doing research on um information overload and when you think about it it in some sense in a lot of social media platforms it is a commons kind of tragedy of the commons kind of problem where if you're in a chat room and there's too many voices saying the same thing at the same time no one benefits from it right uh, but you still want people to add their voice to a certain discussion. So either either like when a community gets too big in a chat room, they you know splinter off into smaller chat rooms, or you increase the cost to communicate such that uh, you only have high value um, or deemed to be higher value communication in that space or or medium or um, forum. Um, and one of the metaphors that I always found to be useful there is is this um it was called like a a resource diagram or I use the uh, another way to usually think of it in my head it's like a whirlpool where like if you add energy into a whirlpool, it starts like going quicker and quicker, but then it adds pressure on the boundaries of the system. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of metaphors that are useful to sometimes describe uh, these systems, especially when they are new um and especially when it's um, necessary or or for people to understand them before they're even willing to participate or interact. I think, you know, with this year in 2021, where uh, a lot of people saw crypto for the first time with NFTs and everything, it's sometimes easy to dismiss it because it's sometimes complex and complicated. Um, and so, you know, I enjoy the fact that boys have to use um, new or as a new ways to frame it to understand how people might see or understand it. And so I also like uh, the, the phrase you use, Jeff, which is commons market makers, because it implies that the economic activity that's being generate, generated there goes back into the commons, which is much more simpler than other phrasing uh, that's been used. I like that. 
And now we have a question actually, public part. Do you want to open your microphone and ask your question? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm really interested in, in learning more about advanced token engineering and especially how that interfaces with social incentives. And I mean, it like we built online communities that have been really meaningful and cohesive for a long time. And now that we're adding money to it, that amplifies a lot of things, but there could be some kind of added issues that I guess we would have to explore. And one of them is like, if there's an exit tax, for instance, does that create fragmentation in the community that could be resolved by some people leaving, but they feel like there's too much money on the line and it would be too costly. Uh, so, I, I would say on that, it depends on how large your exit tax is. I think most of the, most of the, um, but that, even that being said, most of the augmented bonding curve discussions with an exit tax are expecting a um, transferable token. So even if there's an exit tax or an entry tax, uh, let's say that there's no entry tax and there's just an exit tax, which we usually call entry tribute because taxes have bad vibes. So like uh, the, the exit tribute would be, uh, let's say that it's 20%. Uh, the, the market price on Uniswap will always be there. And it will probably float between the minting price of the bonding curve and the exit uh, tribute range. You know, so if it's twenty percent, then the Uniswap price will be floating there, and people can buy and sell without paying the tribute uh, whenever they want because they just go to Uniswap and sell it. But when the Uniswap price drops below the the tribute range, then all of a sudden now there's an arbitrage opportunity. And it's really the arbitrage bots that I would expect will pay the tributes and people will just be, will, won't even use that interface, even though it exists. Did you have anything else? Well, actually, to huh? oh, sorry, I, I was just going to build on, on what Griff was saying about the interaction of the primary and the secondary markets actually is another uh, really interesting property of using a bonding curve in, um, in a, a token ecosystem. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, so uh, using a PAMM, a primary market maker, is actually an interesting kind of parachute on market volatility. Um, so you can, uh, this is just a, a demonstrative um, graph. So having the uh, uh, buy on the top line and the, the sell on the bottom line, you'll actually see your secondary market uh, settle somewhere in between those lines because of those arbitrage opportunities that, that Griff was talking about. And if the secondary market tries to go above uh, the buy or below the sell, uh, it will actually drag the whole system with it and smooth out the volatility. So you'll see in, you know, uh, especially in uh, bull markets or bear markets, massive spikes up and massive drops down, uh, you know, from these pump and dumps, from all sorts of other um, liquidity events in, in DeFi. Uh, and adding in a primary market maker with the arbitrage opportunity of the secondary market will actually uh, work to slow those pumps and the dumps. Uh, and we saw this in um, uh, a live example here. So this is the um, true bit bonding curve. Um, there's some information available, uh, but it's basically a primary market uh, creating this token. The orange line is the buy, the green line is the sell. Uh, so they have quite a large margin between the two. But what you can see here, this was on uh, one of the um, crazy pumps of the of the Truebit token. So you can see the the blue is price in Uniswap. So the Uniswap price was trying to go to the moon, uh, but someone set up an arbitrage bot that was continually uh, buying on the primary market. So it was dragging up the orange line uh, and selling on the secondary market. So it was reining in the the market exuberance on the secondary market. Uh, until this point, you can see probably whoever had this arbitrage bot set up sold a bunch, uh, and the price ended up equilibrating between, again, the buy and the sell, uh, which shows some very interesting kind of in-the-field behavior of these kinds of uh, primary market bonding curves in preventing both uh, market exuberance and, uh, yeah, and, and the ensuing dumps. So hopefully we can use this tool moving forward as a way to kind of smooth out. It's like a, a low-pass filter 
you know, it takes out the, the high volatility and it just kind of smooths the up and smooths the down of these, of these token prices. So really interesting properties to be explored further. Super interesting dynamics. Um, I, yeah, we had uh, a, a uh -huh. uh, Can I just uh, add something there? I think the broad, the broader question of like social incentives with, with monetary incentives is, is something that's always been interesting uh, to me to, to follow. And I think there's, if there's one sort of like short phrase, I usually try to describe it is that um, the protocol should serve the users. The users should not serve the protocol, right? But finding that balance is, is not easy, right? It's not straightforward. Like, you know, sometimes the, the, the systems that we design are more powerful than, than we are capable of managing on our own. So yes, like adding monetary and monetary systems into relationships uh, where there were in monetary systems before does change dynamics. And some of it's good, some of it's bad. I think the, the purpose of, of teams like, you know, everyone here involved um, with what Sean is doing, common stack token engineering is to ask these questions and figure out like, and what circumstances um, is the, the, the sort of externalities becoming negative uh, if we're having too much stuff here. But at the end of the day, at least um, in, a, in a community community like this, people are aware that like we need to be careful with what kind of stuff we introduce into relationships such that the markets that we introduce should still have pro-social positive externalities at the end of the day rather than like new systems of like, you know, unintentional like negative externalities or coercion or like unintended behavior being the end result. But that will always be a trade-off and, and playoff between these two systems. It, the best outcome would be, and I think Griff has talked about this a lot, is like if we could like make public investment more available, that leads to a lot of pro-social positive externalities um, rather than like pure private investment into pure private goods, for example. Just wanted to take uh, the next question from NMA. Did you want to open your mic and ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, thank you guys for the workshop today. It's been great so far. And in relation to, um, I think it was Sean that was mentioning the difficulty with aligning the states on the bonding curve. Sometimes you have a bonding curve where the asset which is being referred to is purely digital, and then you're able to get um, instant um, transactional information about the volume and the value but what happens for example when there's a real world asset involved or, and therefore you have to get information which is off chain and then bring it on into um, and take it in as one of the variables in the bonding curve how do you ensure that sync works as seamlessly as you can um, uh, and and doesn't create uh, governance issues as well um, for the individuals that are involved. Yeah, so I would say that this is kind of where, really where um, good solid token engineering practices come in. And uh, you know, I like I like um, how Zalgam has framed this as configuration spaces. You know, so you can think of the um, all the possible ways in which a thing could play out as being a space and then you want to carve through that space the the boundaries um, which are safe operating boundaries um, and uh, given that these are implemented in real world systems with crazy people um, who can do unpredictable things you know you need to run this in an agent-based modeling kind of way and 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 throw in those unpredictable crazy things and then see what happens does it break and so on and so so the responsible thing to do is to build these systems such that they have been um, configured and then and then simulated and tested and then have an ongoing feedback loop um, on the the core design in terms of the, the configuration parameters and so on, um, uh, so that you can continue to 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 feed that back. Um, but having said all of that, in terms of now bringing information into the bonding curve, this is where where our uh, work with with uh, Zagam and, and the team on uh, risk-adjusted bonding curves you know, has 
hopefully shifted the game. I think we still got, have a lot of uh, um, more experimentation and evidence gathering to do on, on, on lots of different sort of use cases of these primitives. Um, the, the main uh, principle of it is that you have an alpha value, which is a, a prediction on a future um, outcome. So when we link these bonds to, to some kind of outcome, and it could be a, an outcome payment, it could even be um, um, a, a, like staking rewards. Uh, that if you stake for a period of time, you're going to get pay, payouts and it could be periodic. There's lots of different ways you can configure it. But if we have a prediction on whether that outcome state is going to be achieved or not, um, the, the bond can be repriced and that gets repriced through a parameter coming in and adjusting the, the shape of the curve essentially. So um, if, the, uh, if the probability of an outcome state being achieved uh, decreases the bonding curve, kind of pulls back. You can think of it like your foot on the on the on the gas, kind of like pulling it back a bit. Um, and uh, and so you dynamically reprice based on the signal that's coming in. So there's generally two categories of signals. The one is you know, signals that come from oracles um, of all different types, and because it's a primitive, you know, we don't say prescriptively what the source could be, um, but or there's many different ways you can set it up. And the other is more of an internal mechanism, which is um, where the bond uh, token holders um, participate in a prediction market. And so they, they take a, a bet on a, um, on a success or failure pool uh, and therefore have an economic incentive as to whether the outcome is achieved. Um, but if it's done in a way that the um, economic game theory and, uh, and, and math around it is done such that you will always do better if um, the outcome is achieved. Uh, you, you're, you, you're able to uh, get the participants to reveal their, their private beliefs in that, in that alpha, in that outcome. Um, and so uh, this is a kind of way of decreasing the informational asymmetries that we normally see within any marketplace where those who have kind of got insider information, I guess, is the sort of the most kind of um, perverse extreme of that would use that information against the market um, to to get an advantage. Uh, in this case, we have a, um, a uh, an incentive mechanism where there's an incentive to reveal your private belief. Um, and so this is different from um, from a typical prediction market where uh, the, you have um, no skin in the game as to whether the outcome is positive or negative. Um, you're just concerned about whether you're going to win the bet or not. In this case, because you're a token holder in the bond and you get to use your bond tokens to bet on success or failure, it's a different dynamic. Um, so these are some of the ways that we've been experimenting with, with how you get real-world information into the bonding curve mechanism. I just yeah. dropped some links. Did you have anything um, you wanted to ask in, in response, NMA? Yeah, definitely. First, it's a follow-up to both of you, actually, because... Um, uh, first and foremost, Jessica, I was actually asking the question in relation to real world assets when it comes to energy credits and the fact that um, energy credits need to be verified in an off-chain manner before they're brought into any sort of um, on-chain treasury um, and implemented into the bonding curve. So it's really cool that you guys are already looking into that and I'm definitely going to check out the links that you sent. Um, and then in regards to um, what you were saying, Sean, uh, I really like the two methods. One seems uh, more uh, sh short term and it can really uh, focus on when there is an immediate impact um, with the oracles. And then the other one is more long term when you want to create a, a, an off-chain implementation into the on-chain using the um, is it quadratic voting that they used to do that? I'm, I'm not too sure. But yeah, it, it's, it's cool to see that there's already some uh, developments um, moving into this area. Um, I'm really focused on like more the governance of that. That's like a, a really big um, area of um, my research. But it's really good to see that already on the tokenomic side, things are developing. All right, thank you so much. Absolutely. So yeah, I dropped some links um, in the community hall chat if anyone was interested to learn more about risk-adjusted bonding curves and some of Sean Conway's work. And then I also dropped an article 
Um, we're working on some research at Block Science and exactly what you're talking about NMA with real world assets and particularly how to handle semi fungible assets. Um, so some interesting research going on there. Um, and meantime, Livia had a question. Did you want to open your mic and, and ask Livia? Feel free to direct it to a particular person. Sure. Um, maybe to Jeff, because he was talking about um, uh, the exit tribute and that, that that is the most natural incentive to have an exit tribute instead of an entry tribute. But uh, as Griff was talking about the arbitrage bots being potentially the biggest users of the bond curve, would it be interesting to have a small entry tribute? Definitely, um, both are configurable. Um, so generally, in the in, when we're designing primitives, we leave a lot of these sort of like boxes can be turned on and turned off depending on the um, systemic effects that you're looking for. Um, the reason we started with the exit tribute over the entry tribute, I mean, most DAOs operate as a as an entry tribute. So like a Moloch DAO, for example, you you uh, buy in your your shares. Um, you now have uh, basically access to controlling uh, the funds that are in the Moloch DAO. But what happens over time is you have this um, sort of uh, drawdown of funds, um, which kind of leads to less, mm, less engagement over time because the funds are being spent uh, as more people are joining. So there's less incentive to join over time. The interesting thing with the exit tax is this kind of like uh, gives a jolt of new energy into the system every time someone leaves. So you have this like injection of of new capital, which creates a uh, new incentive for, for people to, um, to participate. Uh, it also counters that run on the bank effect. So yeah, you definitely can have an entry tribute. Um, uh, it kind of, the other reason we, we introduced the, the tribute on the exit side primarily is it kind of acts like a hysteresis to keep people in the system. We don't want people to leave the system. We want people to enter. So we kind of, we, if we put the friction on leaving and not on joining, then we'll, you know, more people can enter and fewer people will exit. Of course, we can put a, a small entry tribute and a small exit tribute. And if it is the arbitrage bots, uh, you know, there will be uh, income on, on both sides. Um, we do have the, the hatch tribute. So essentially in the augmented bonding curve, there's the hatch or the initialization. Uh, which is the kind of initial capital formation. Everyone does an um, uh, initial purchase at a, at a flat rate, uh, and a portion of that does go into the, into the common pool. So there is kind of an entry tribute uh, in, the, in the ABC, but you could add yeah, an, an entry tax and an exit tax uh, as well. So there, there's yeah. customization available depending on the system properties that you're looking for. Yeah, the the, re the real magic of the exit tax uh, is that when when you're when people are leaving, they're burning their tokens, right? So there's less supply governing the common pool because this the augmented bonding curve. You have the bonding curve, and then you have a pool of funds that's being governed by token holders. So if you have the, if you have a, uh, once it's running, if you have like a solid exit tribute. Then, uh, when people are burning their tokens, that means fewer tokens are governing this pot of fund, and the pot of funds is growing. So you kind of have a double-edged push back, bringing like saying, "Hey, look, the governance value of your token is increasing in two ways. There are fewer governance tokens governing a larger pot of funds every time someone exits. So once it's launched, then it's a really good idea to have a solid exit tribute." Uh, but actually, uh, we're discovering through our like collaborative economics with the dashboard that it's really interesting to have a high entry tribute to launch because that's the only way to uh, get liquid tokens into the market. So now you have like almost a second hatch with this new entry tribute. And so actually having a high entry tribute at launch uh, because all the other tokens that exist will be frozen. Uh, will will be b very beneficial in funding the the common pool, and then having the community actually like vote to reduce it is a, a an increased exit tribute before the the hatch tokens become unlocked. You know, uh, is like another um, pattern that's just emerging in practice, uh, at least in our economic debates, which are really fun. Uh, so. 
And we've talked a lot about um, the bonding curve in the in the various contexts of um, ownership and um, commons and and how they're augmented. But I know there are some other really interesting applications for bonding curves. So I don't know if uh, Simon or Jeff, you want to talk about potential other uses, and especially Simon, you were mentioning your kind of content explorations for staking reputation, and how can bonding be bonding curves be used? other than uh, in the context we've been uh, discussing so far? Yeah, it's a cool question because I actually have a project that uh, uses bonding curves that is not necessarily in this context. Um, so uh, what the project is, it, it's an NFT project where the bonding curve issues new NFTs, but each NFT is a generative art. Um, and so uh, how it works is you whatever the current price is in the bonding curve you pay that and you get a new uh, artwork being minted uh, the project name is called neoelastics and it's a reference to the art movement neoplasticism but um uh, over time obviously like a bonding curve people will mint these artworks and burn these artworks and i think um uh, i have some stats on here i can get um i got a there's... green square i got a green oh yeah <laughs> so the, there's like different generative art components about it that would generate certain rarities and stuff with the the piece but um there's two there's 2537 pieces that have been minted um but there's currently only 438 in circulation so the rest were just people buying and burning the pieces um but what was interesting and one of the reasons why i did the project besides just making cool art with this is that by putting nfts on a bonding curve like this especially with generative art there is this implicit um uh, market uh, activity happening where people are implicitly curating the the sort of um, available set of artworks in circulation because if you mint one that you don't like you're more likely or inclined to sell it back and burn it into the, the bonding curve but there's also this 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 appeal where people would promote the project because if more people are interested in it they would obviously buy a piece for themselves as well um and so what you have what you see is over time is that the pieces that um remain in the set 438 or current in circulation are the ones that people feel they like the most and so you're, you're implicitly curating a set through this mechanism of sort of this latent space of potential generative art. I think there's like um, like 10 million potential variations. And now there's only 438 in circulation out of the 2,500 that have been able to be minted. Um, so people are slowly curating it merely through market activity. I keep what I hold. And that means that whatever is there is what people feel is the most interesting ones. So there's like this this unintentional activity, pos supposedly positive activity with something like this. Um, but yeah, this it's a it's a it's a it's a primitive that can be used in various different ways, from building communities to interesting art experiments. So you know, hopefully there's there's a lot more that can be done still. I think one of the very powerful use cases that we're seeing now is to to actually use them as treasuries for for creating money. Um, so whether it's a community currency or it's um, linking it to a, a stable uh, currency mechanism, so finance mechanisms um, such as um, MakerDAO with um, with the DAI um, and Olympus DAO and uh, and so on, um, with uh, some of the opposite ki uh, kind of um, incentives to what we've been talking about in terms of taxes and so on, actually bringing. Um, uh, like staking rewards into the into the whole mix. So with Olympus DAO, you're incentivized, um, and the same with Climate DAO, you're incentivized to take your, your bond, bonding curve tokens and lock them up, which means that essentially you're kind of committing to um, maintaining the saved assets within the reserve of the bond. Um, now, one of the challenges with uh, a simple bonding curve design is that you can only utilize a portion of the capital um, for productive uses, so for real economy uses. Um, most of it is just kind of DeFi financial economy um, um, sort of dynamics. Um, and so in terms of like the productive use of capital, you want to be able to um, use the essentially borrow against the bond um, is one kind of way of looking at it. 
um, or uh, uh, swap the assets that are in the reserve of the bond for other types of assets, which is what Climadar has done. So Climadar takes um, the, um, uh, the the stable token um, that's put into the reserve and uses that to purchase carbon certificates on traditional registries and then bridges those across in a, across in, a, in an NFT tokenized form. Um, and so. Uh, what these treasuries are starting to be backed by is not only stable tokens, but also other forms of assets, um, such as carbon credits. And uh, really, I, I think this is an incredibly enormous opportunity. I just wrote a, an article published a couple of days ago um, from billions to trillions, um, talking about how potentially the, these mechanisms with the governance layer on top can um, serve as decentralized develop, development banks. Um, and mobilize very large amounts of capital. So, uh, um, and this, uh, this is a uh, thinking that seems to be really um, catching on. So even with MakerDAO, um, you know, which currently has um, um, a basket of, of, uh, of ERC-20 tokens backing the, the treasury, um, there is a proposal within that community to shift those tokens across to clean money tokens. So assets that represent um, climate positive um, assets as the collateral for for the stable currency and so what we see is the potential to have money being um, backed by natural assets and by um, by the, the, the public good um, uh, assets and natural resources that need to be generated and, and, and need to be invested in for uh, climate finance uh, and sustainable development goal purposes. Um, and so I, I really think you know this is very nascent, um, but, but if we look at the uh, huge amount of capital that's been raised by Climate DAO as an example, and also the birth of many, many more DAOs in the last weeks, even um, with this kind of design, it's it's a it's a really important idea. Yeah, we would love it if you could share that article with us, Sean. If you want to drop that to me, and I'll share it in the community hall channel. Um, or if you can drop it there. And then I just wanted to make sure we have uh, just a couple of minutes left and Tamara had a question actually, if you wanna open your mic and ask the question. And I guess this will be the last one as we're almost at the top of the hour here. Hey, <laughs> just in time. Yeah, I was wondering about the breaking point of augmented bonding curves and when, at what point is an economy too large and what criteria do you use to, to determine it? What does it look like when it breaks? Sorry, terminology. Uh, I, I don't think we really know yet. Right, like DXDAO said that they had a large enough market cap and they had liquidity solutions and that the bonding curve was dragging them down uh, once they got to a certain size. So, and I think it's kind of up to each community to determine themselves uh, because it, you, you re there's too many factors at play. Like, do you have li enough liquidity on an open market? Also, are you in a bear market or a bull market? Because if you're in a bull market and everything is booming, then like the bonding curve kind of drags you down. Uh, if you're in a bear market, then it acts as a parachute, as Jeff said. So if the if the if the economic system that you're in is is crashing, you know, like like when crypto markets just start going down, then probably just want to like keep that bonding curve to like support you, you know. But eventually, if you get to a certain size that money could be used to fund public goods. So if you have enough liquidity and you have revenue streams outside of the entry and exit tributes and, and you've become like a sustainable entity, then why have a, a more issuance, right? Why do you want to print more money? Uh, it ends up, uh, you, may, you may want to actually just stabilize your currency. And I really, I really um, did a disservice to not show off the augmented bonding curve like design tool that we have which is really cool so i i, uh, I definitely want to share this um collaborative economic experiment that is happening right now uh the in the tec and so we actually have this system where you can uh experience design a bonding curve and experience it yourself by adding simulating transactions into the, into the bonding curve so uh, you can see I, I've simulated a bunch of transactions here and it kind of shows you like, okay, here's uh, how much is in the reserve, how many tokens exist, here's what the price is, someone buys 250K, here's how the price changes, and maybe I, I want to change the opening price or something like that, then it can, um, it can like, uh, 
you can you can fix it. Oops, I kind of broke it. This is you can see by the URL. This is a, a developed branch version, but um, uh, you can you can adjust your bonding curve and change the res and by adjusting the amount that goes into the bonding curve uh, and putting more into the common pool, you're changing the reserve ratio and uh, it's just a really cool tool for actually designing uh, economies collaboratively where anybody can submit an economic design and then fork, for, that economic design can be forked and changed by anybody. And you can, in a way, collaboratively and iteratively design an economy. So it's super cool. Uh, and if you guys want to learn more, there's like, go to the dashboard and there's this uh, join our primary, parameter parties. And um, you can like uh, actually come help design a, a really a $1.5 million economy and learn how to uh, really get a deep dive into like live token engineering learning experience, like a, a token engineering boot camp. Probably take, you know, two hours and you will uh, understand the whole system and be able to design an economy that could potentially be the actual economy used uh, by the TC. Yeah. Thanks for the invite, Griff. Um, and we can drop some more links below. But I guess we are at the top of the hour here. But maybe we want to just give like 30 seconds to one minute to each uh, panelist to kind of give last thoughts or maybe interesting thoughts about you know what the future of bonding curves could look like. So I'll pass it to uh, Sean to start us off. And wrap, wrap, actually. Yeah, so, so I. I I think the, the cool thing about this is that we've got some primitives. I, you know, I like this whole concept of having bids as building blocks and to be able to, in a DeFi space, kind of build things with them. Um, the message that, that I think is becoming resoundingly kind of louder is to focus more on the refi than the DeFi. Um, so DeFi tends to be a bit degenerative. Refi is regenerative. And you get refi when you link these things to the real world and, and changes that are happening in the real world. Um, so that's a, an emerging and big space, and it's a really exciting place to be. Uh, definitely. And, and just to, to build on that, um, I think we're still only in the first steps of exploring these primitives. Um, and a lot of the, the first use cases are economic, but actually bonding curves could be an interface between any two system components. Um, so just to throw out another example uh, between um, uploading and downloading in a torrent system. Uh, there's crazy free riding in, in torrents, right? The vast majority of people just download, very few upload. Well, what if you created a bonding curve that only allowed you to download a certain amount pending on the amount you upload? So you could you could link these two non-financial uh, system aspects and, and create a bonding curve saying, you know, you have to produce at least this much to download this much uh, and create a bonding curve for that. So I think there's all sorts of interesting use cases for these primitives. Uh, both within uh, DeFi and economics, but also within, um, you know, cyber physical systems between the digital and, and the real world uh, all over the place. So, yeah, really interesting stuff to come. Uh, Simon? The future of bonding curves is uh, right here. Uh, I think there is so many cool stuff coming out of this space and this community. And whenever I'm interested to see what's been done, I, I come and take a look at what the chatter is here. Um, and as both Jeff and Sean said, again, at the end of the day, a primitive and the value of blockchain ecosystems is composability, be able to reuse, reuse and remix and create new derivatives and new communities. So, you know, it's always worth paying attention to. And I think there's a lot more coming. Griff? Yeah, I would I would say this is the I, I really do believe that public uh, bonding curves are the future of public goods funding and the, the way to create economies that actually produce real value for society. Abundance economics will be built on uh, bonding curves where scarcity economics can be, it can continue on its own way, but we can, we can do something better. And uh, if you guys want to play with it, you should. You should really dive in these param parties. There's so many opportunities to hang out uh, in IXO and Commons, the token engineering commons, DX DAO. There, there's lots of interesting communities playing with bonding curves, and you can learn a lot just by hanging out in the discords, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's all of us, right? Jess, do you want to close us out? Yeah, sure. So, 
Super appreciate everyone attending. Thank you so much for being engaged and asking questions. And of course, um, we're always here on the Common Stack Discord. And we're so lucky that uh, Simon and Sean, you took your time to join us today. We really appreciate it and know how busy you are. Um, we also have loads of ways to connect. So if you just have any further questions, uh, feel free to jump into the Discord. We're also open on future at AMAs to any questions. I saw Chewy, you had a question that didn't get answered. You can direct that to Simon. Um, but certainly anytime you have questions, we have these AMAs every month, the last Wednesday of the month. And we also have uh, trusted seat office hours and we're gonna be soon. Uh, Common Stack is gonna unveil a members spotlight edition. So we wanna get to know more about you. Um, NMA, you had some great questions and, and sounds like your research is really interesting. So we definitely want to hear more from you and what you're working on and how we can uh, collaborate and, and build these ties going forward. So thank you so much again for joining. And we'll have this recording up on all of our channels if you want to share with anyone that's really interested in all things Spawning Curve. So thanks everyone so much. Have a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. And thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank